Prologue Clone By saying I'm a clone, I immediately become the unimportant copy. The faceless guy with the same haircut as my brethren. A borrower. Not my own being. I walk in someone else's shoes. At least, that's how I was supposed to be. Chapter 1 1672 stared into opaqueness the way he had for seventeen years. He was surrounded by implacable white walls, blank as blank could be. Along the walls were windows, heavily frosted so that the sun was muted to a gray blur. Occasionally, 1672 was rewarded with a shadow gliding past. Silhouettes of other clans. The figures loomed, slanted from the sun's angle. Mandy, record the window, 1672 ordered. A beep. The walls hummed with mechanical life. A small, barely noticeable aperture blinked open. 1672 would inspect the video later, trying to decipher the shadows that splayed across the windows. 1672 reached out to touch a man-shaped shadow before it flittered away, leaving a fingerprint on the matte glass. Twig is home, Mandy chimed from above. 1672 hastily wiped the fingerprint from the glass with his sleeve, turning around as Twig walked into the living room. 1672's sponsor was the only other human he had ever seen. Twig wore an all-white uniform of simple pants and a long-sleeved v-neck shirt. The left breast was marked with the clan symbol, a Y-shape, the right prong's tip segmented off. On the opposite side was the vertical ID number, two. Even though Twig was no longer at the lab inspecting freshborns, he still wore his biodata monitoring glasses. 1672 didn't know whether Twig kept them on to read 1672's health status or to hide his own emotions. The glasses emitted faint blue light. His eyes never showed. You skipped lunch? Twig asked. Are you sick again? 1672 turned away. We are not sick. We weren't hungry. He wasn't sure why he was taught to refer to himself as we. He was alone. So very alone. 1672 remembered the shadows against the glass. We would like to go out, 1672 said. Twig's expression remained unmoving. This is a useless discussion. I've gone over this before. Twig always referred to himself as I. 1672 assumed this was because his sponsor was higher up than the others and somehow had to be segmented from the rest of the clan. 1672 gestured toward the window. The clan's out there. They walk in one direction at the same time every day. Twig frowned. Did you look out the window? We see the shadows across the window. Yes. They walk from the pod to the hive. They helped tend the fetuses and freshborns. 1672 didn't know exactly what the job entailed, but it sounded more interesting than being trapped in their home. We would like to go. Twig looked into space for a while, and 1672 wondered whether his sponsor was going to ignore him as usual. Instead, Twig sighed. <sighs> Listen, I suppose it's time I explain something to you. 1672 stiffened trying to maintain his neutral face. Did he have some serious virus that could infect others? Was he born completely and irreparably wrong, and therefore forever isolated? Our computer systems aren't perfect, Twig said. 1672's heart skipped a beat. There was a glitch a while back with one of the computers maintaining the incubation tank. It was tank number 1672. 1672 swallowed, his pulse quickening. But you said it's your job to prevent glitches from happening. A shiver ran down 1672's spine. You said you have to get rid of clans who are different. Twig studied the wall, his hands fidgeting. That's true, Twain. Twain. The name Twig gave him for his own personal use. Several years ago, 
Twain had Mandy look up the definition. The word Twain meant separation. You were replicated from the same gene, Twig said. But there was, and still is, something off. Our health is bad, Twain said. But we can get better. That's why we're still alive, right, Father? Twig frowned. Genetic mutation can seriously endanger the health and lifespan of a human body. The glitch made you weak. You cannot go outside the way you are. How can we recover faster? You listen to the computer. Eat and rest when you are told. Twain stood up straighter to show his strength. We can pretend we are not sick. They won't know. We'll look exactly the same on the outside. Twig tensed. Why can't you understand the logic? It's simple. You can't fit in. Twain slouched back to his normal posture. He didn't like upsetting his usually calm sponsor. Most of all, he didn't like to have his mind questioned. He always solved all the math problems the computer threw at him during his lessons. He was capable of understanding logic. Just not this one. Your glasses will tell you if we are ill, Twain said. That's why you wear them. If only we could see what you see. Twig sighed. <sighs> you want to see what I see? Okay, I will show you why you can't mingle with clans. Twain drew in a breath. His sponsor moved toward the window. He put his hand to the glass and did a quick, complex tap sequence with his fingers. The frosted cover went across halfway, revealing transparent glass. Bright blue sky. Twain's eyes widened. Twig gestured for Twain to come closer. Be careful now, Twig warned. Make sure nobody sees you. Twain eagerly stepped forward and peered out, his eyes taking in greedy gulps of the world outside. Concrete buildings, the street, figures walking across the pavement. Five of them. Boys his age wearing the same uniform as his sponsor. More joined them. There were ten, twelve. As if multiplying, a dozen more clans walked past. Countless numbers of them. Twain's heart yearned to be with them. They looked exactly like him, except that their hair was cut close to the scalp. Twain touched his own hair, which Twig had allowed to grow longer. Our hair is different. You don't need to cut it often, Twig replied. Nobody sees you. But we are the same once our hair is cut. We can go out there. Look closer. Twain narrowed his eyes and inspected the boys. It was difficult to see them in detail from afar. Their eyes were fierce, but it could be because they were squinting in the sun. We are the same, Twain repeated. You can't see the difference? Twig tapped the glass again. The frosted sheathing slowly slid back. Twain made a cry of disappointment, trying to keep his eyes on the boys for as long as possible. I'll show you, Twig said. Father, Twain implored, pointing at the window. Please, let us see them again. We... Twain stopped. Twig removed his glasses for the first time. The glasses had been like the windows, hiding something. His sponsor's irises were dark. Twain gasped. What happened to your eyes, father? Twig's eyes softened with something like pity. Is that how Twig's eyes always looked behind his glasses? Nothing. We clans all have brown eyes. Twain glanced back at the frosted window, remembering the boys' eyes that seemed darker. So, I can't get better. We understand, father. We are sorry for asking questions. Twain walked past his sponsor his steps quickening as he got farther away. Once he was in the bathroom, his head spun. Pain seeped into his heart. He approached the mirror. His irises were so light they almost matched the white walls behind him. Twain's vision blurred, his reflection dissolving away into a fog like the figures he had watched for the past seventeen years. He was a glitch, hidden from the perfect world, never to be healed.